So uh, welcome everyone. Let me make sure that we are live. Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome again, uh, those of us uh, who are here on Zoom, but also those who are watching uh, live, watching us live on Facebook. Um, welcome. This is uh, the fifth and final session of the Baal Shem Tov, A Life of Ecstasy with uh, Rabbi uh, Ariel Even Mays. Um, just uh, a note about engagement, uh, feel free to participate verbally if you're here with us on Zoom. Just remember to uh, mute yourself when you're not actively talking and unmute when you're ready to speak again. You can also participate uh, in writing um, here on the chat on Zoom or as a comment on Facebook. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this to you, Rabbi Mays. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here again. Um, sad that this is our last session, but happy to have had this time together and really looking forward to another hour and 15 minutes of thinking and learning and being in this space. So we've talked a lot about the Baal Shem Tov as a figure from the forest. We've thought about divine imminence. We've thought about the imperative to serve God in all modes of life and through all kinds of action. We have thought about um, the Baal Shem Tov's journey to the land of Israel and perhaps the way that that, um, again, it's not exactly a star-crossed journey, even if it doesn't become full in its uh, achievement of its goal. It is a journey that perhaps becomes the kind of template or the type scene for religious life as a kind of journey which is never ending and one in which the revelation of divinity happens along the way in the workings of the quest rather than in the destination and we talked last time about prayer about tefillah and about in particular the language of prayer as a kind of vessel for divinity and there is this amazing theological move that happens within the world of early Hasidut in which the orality of prayer, in which the words that one says, which of course are both ethereal and deeply embodied, there's the kind of resonance that gives rise to language within the, the, within the chest, within the throat, within the mouth, and that becomes a garment for the divine, which again is mostly coherent, or at least mostly um, compatible with earlier types of Kabbalah, and yet represents a kind of, if not a distillation, a, uh, a focusing of those Kabbalistic traditions into a kind of devotional mentality that is largely accessible, if not universally accessible. And then just to close, the last time we also discussed the Baal Shem Tov's um, Rosh Hashanah journey all the way into the celestial heavens and his questioning of the Messiah of when you will come. And the self-confidence of the Besht's own image of himself really comes through when the, when the, uh, the Messiah tells him, well, when everyone can do the connective work that you can do, the Messiah will come. So today we're going to talk about community. Um, one of the distinguishing features of Hasidism is that it is a socially integrated, maybe even socially imbricated in the sense of things that hold on to one another type of mysticism. Um, it's not unknown in religious traditions that mysticism is communal. Um, you find this in Sufism. You find this in certain types of monastic Christianity. Um, you find this also certainly in Buddhist and in Hindu traditions, if we want to use the term mysticism to apply to them, which itself is already a complicated issue. Um, but in Judaism, it's actually a kind of complicated story because mystical traditions by and large were exercised within very small communities. This goes back all the way to the 13th century, to the time of the earliest Kabbalists. In a certain sense, rabbinic Judaism, as it emerges from the rabbis of the Talmud, is a kind of minority report. There are lots of other kinds of Judaism at that time. And rabbinic Judaism itself, from what we know, doesn't seem like it's the only, and certainly maybe even not the dominant, form of Judaism at its time. But of course, it's the type that we know 
and love. The, um, the mystics of the so-called chariot literature of the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries of going up into the heavens, of going to look to see the divine palace, the Hechalot to the Merkava, um, these seem like they're very small groups of people. The Rhineland Pietists, it's one family. It's one family with some cousins who forever changed the face of Ashkenazi Judaism, um, but they're a very small group of people. The first sort of group of mystics that we know by name comes to us from the school of Isaac the Blind in Provence. Um, Isaac the Blind, who um, has a couple of disciples that make their way to Iberia. Isaac the Blind writes a letter to his disciples telling them to put the cat back into the bag if such a thing is possible and telling them what you guys are are speaking about publicly and perhaps even writing down actually really needs to be kept under wraps and there are two versions of this letter he says Adavar hanichtav, ein lo, and it's a question is it ein lo adon or ein lo aron the written word has no master that's one version of it all right because once you once you put something in writing it's universally accessible and the second is um once you have brought something into the public sphere in lo aron you can't put it back uh, on the bookshelf it's public knowledge and there's this real sensibility in early kabbalah that things need to be kept kept close in part that's because they're complicated and in part, that's because they dance with heresy. Um, you know, as an early anti-Kabbalistic Jewish thinker says, um, I've seen these new manuscripts, and oy vey, ten gods, that's even worse than three. And he sees in it a kind of echoing of Christian heresy. And so early Kabbalah definitely sees has a kind of internal protective mechanism um, against that. That changes with the Zohar. Um, the Zohar is widely published and widely read, but of course the Zohar itself is the product of perhaps one person, perhaps a small group of people, and it's their literary and theological imagination, but you don't get the sense from reading the Zohar that 13th century Iberia, 13th century Spain, all the Jews are doing this kind of thing. In fact, it seems very unlikely. The revolution, the renaissance in 16th century Safed, Tzfat, we know a couple of dozen people by name and that's not an insignificant chunk of the town. On the other hand, the number of Jewish thinkers in Tzfat who really changed the face of Jewish life, eight, 10, 12, and there's no inkling in those sources of we gotta turn this into a mass movement. In fact, on the contrary, Chaim Vital, um, a name perhaps known to many of you here, Chaim Vital, the great student of Rabbi Isaac Luria, goes in the exact opposite direction. And he's like the nightmare literary executor that no one wants. He keeps all of the manuscripts to himself and says no one can have access to them. And his son has some of them. Once he dies, a few of them kind of sneak out or squeak out but mostly it's kept really, really close. And it's the other students of the Ari that really spread the teachings far and wide. But at this point, we're still talking about the number of figures you can count on perhaps two hands, and maybe if you wanna take a very broad lens, um, you have to involve your toes. That really changes with Sabbateanism in the 17th century, when Shabtai Tzvi and his prophet Nathan of Gaza um, create this kind of messianic movement. Um, in that time, you don't have dozens of figures, but you have hundreds. And eventually you have thousands. And that's a really big change. Mystical teachings, some elements thereof, perhaps in vastly simplified form, are very, very common. But the notion of this kind of intensified mystical life, of being fully devoted to these mystical aims um, and goals 
it's very small. There's a very small number of people who are engaged in that. But that changes with Sabbateanism as hundreds of people are prophesizing, as many, many people are selling their property and trying to move to 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 be close to Shabtai Tzvi. There's a sense that the kingdom has come and a new kind of Jewish life is being born, a Jewish political and also theological life. That obviously collapses, at least for some number of Sabbateans, when Shabtai Tzvi converts to Islam, um, which is an awkward thing for a Messiah to do, but not by any means unjustifiable. And there are very interesting things in the Kabbalistic literature where they really try and work that out. It's a fascinating thing. Um, on the other hand, that leaves a lot of people frightened of mystical religion and its misuses. And by the 18th century, there are um, some strictures placed on who can and cannot access this material. And it's by and large only people who are um, the scholarly elites who have access to Kabbalistic manuscripts, even though um, they're being widely published toward the end of the 18th century. Um, they're not being published as pulp fiction for, for, for mass consumption. Beth. Yes, I'm curious as to what we know about the uh, practices of the followers, especially of Shabbatai V. Um, what were they doing with themselves beyond following him? I mean, were they engaging in specific practices, trying to elevate themselves? What were they up to? <laughs> so there are, um, you know, there's an old sort of, assumption about the study of Jewish mysticism, that it was really all about the ideas. And Sholem is often described as being only interested in the, um, in the intellectual history of, of Jewish mysticism, less so in the actual practices. I think that's a miscasting of Sholem himself. He talks about the brilliance of Shabtai Tzvi, um, and to a lesser degree, the Ari, as having the mind of a ritualist. The pageantry of Shabtai Tzvi is actually a very important part of his life. When he marries the Torah, when he consumes the forbidden fat because he is the altar and so he can actually eat it, when he pronounces the name of God and does these things that are seeming transgressions, which are actually his kind of living out of the messianic halacha. Um, that's really important in Sabbateanism. Now, for some Sabbateans in the 18th century, in the 17th century, they're indistinguishable. They're doing everything that normative Jews are doing, and they're following everything. They're just doing it be because or to support Shabdai Tzvi, the Messiah. Some of them are singing songs which have hidden meanings. Some of them are singing songs that actually say Shabdai Tzvi, our King, our Messiah. Some of them are taking Lurianic customs, which are spreading in the in in the seventeenth century. They're spreading farther and wider, and they're imbuing them with a specific kind of Sabbatean meaning. A lot of them are also doing this work through commentary. There's no verse in the Torah, says one early Sabbatean theologian, that doesn't talk about Shabtai Tzvi. So there's the 70 faces of the Torah, which according to Kabbalah Ta'ari becomes the 600,000 faces. And one of those 600,000 faces is just Shabtai Tzvi. And <clears throat> in addition to that, there are certain groups of Sabbateans that go the transgressive route. And they feel like Shabtai Tzvi, that they are meant either to follow Shabtai Tzvi into the world of Islam, the Donme in Turkey are a good example of this, who become Muslims, kind of, mostly, not exactly. And the Frankists in um, the followers of Jacob Frank in 18th century Poland are a good example of that. They convert not to Islam, but to Christianity, to Catholicism. Um, more on that a little bit later. Um, but if you're interested in the ritual life of, let's say, Jewish mystics more broadly, there are a couple of books on this subject. Most of them are only in Hebrew, and they're by a scholar named Moshe Chalamish, who knows everything about ritual and um, the interface of Kabbalah and ritual. And there's a very good, not exactly a summary, but a kind of um, 
distillation of his, I don't know what the uh, plural of magnum opus is, but whatever that is, um, his many, many large tomes on this subject by Moshe Feierstein um, called Jewish Customs of Mystical Origin, which is, um, it's a really good sort of primer toward thinking about sometimes things that we don't know are Kabbalistic and also things that we would never have heard of that are Kabbalistic. But everything from, you know, Kabbalat Shabbat on Friday night to looking at your fingernails um, in the Havdalah candle to a whole host of other things have Kabbalistic origins. Sure. Any other questions? Great. So the mystical dimension, sorry, the social dimension of Hasidism takes on several forms. I'm just going to check in the chat here. Okay, it looks like good, good, good. Okay, the social dimension of Hasidism takes on um, several forms. I think we can kind of distill it down to two things. One is that there's a new social movement happening here. And Sometimes scholars argue that Hasidism is really born out of the collapse of Jewish communal autonomy and things like that in, this, in the 18th century, which is probably not entirely untrue, but it's also not the full story. But it is true that for whatever reason, what we're beginning to see is a new kind of social organization. The Baal Shem Tov lives not at the margins of human society. He's right there at the center of the Jewish community, but his power, let's say his authority, comes both because he is granted that by the community, but it doesn't come because of his Talmudic erudition or his learning. It comes from his abilities as a healer and a teacher. So in the words of sociology, we would say that his authority is charismatic. And I think that's actually, in the Weberian sense, like charisma as something that is galvanizing and transformative and sometimes radical and destabilizing as opposed to being a voice of tradition or a voice of the lawgiver or whatever it might be. Um, charisma is a, uh, is a powerful social force and that's what we see embodied in the Baal Shem Tov. Um, you see this also in his disciples, the Magid of Mesrich, who is a preacher, uh, he's a Magid, um, doesn't lay claim to his social position by dint of his Talmudic learning, but by dint of his spiritual and clairvoyant power. Why, do we, why does he have followers? It's said that he has followers because he can greet them by name before they even introduce themselves. Why does he have followers? In the words of a 19th or early 20th century Hasidic figure, because he can read what's written on their supplications, the notes that they bring to him. He knows what's written in them before he opens them. And that's, that's a twofold comment. One, he's got these magical clairvoyant powers. Two, and I think this is actually the key. Um, these are not people that he's meeting for the first time, but people he knows well. He knows what's in their hearts. And this notion of the leader as being founded in connection and connectivity is the second point, which is that on the one hand, we do see the emergence of a new social order. Rather than the synagogue, it's the Hasidic house of study that's the center. Rather than the rabbi, the rav, in the like traditional sense, it's the rebbe, it's a particular kind of spiritual and charismatic leader. And alongside of that, we have the development of a new theology in which the road to heaven leads through the heart of the human being in front of you. And that's true on both the, let's say, the teacher-student level, and it's true on the level of fellow travelers in the Hasidic community. So for like to almost in the first time since Sabbateanism, you have people who are united by faith in the Jewish community, but not by town. So you'll have people who become followers of a particular Hasidic path who may not live in the same city, but all see themselves as somehow united by their reverence for a particular teacher and following in that spiritual path. That you find at the early 
in the earliest stages um, of Hasidism as a social movement in the 1770s and the 1780s. You don't have that in the time of the Baal Shem Tov, but what you do have is the beginning of a theology in which mysticism is not at the expense of this worldly engagement, but rather through this worldly engagement. Think back to the source that we read about Hanoch, about this, the shoemaker, and we talked about the social implications. Well, now it's going to come home to roost, and we're going to see a host of sources that describe the Baal Shem Tov and, and come from the Baal Shem Tov on the social power of this spiritual message. So far, so good. Okay, any questions about what I've said? Thanks, Stephen, for dropping that into the uh, into the chat. Good. Okay, so let's read a source together. Um, we talked about Hanoch, the source about the shoemaker, as one of the ones that is quoted, I think, a couple of dozen times in the writings of Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya. Um, so we're going to read first a source from Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya, and then we're going to read a source from the Baal Shem Tov writing to Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya, um, both of which really come to this question of social life. Um, Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya deploys the first source that we're going to look at um, uh, in, in the Session 5 community source sheet, um, I think an equal number of times. I think that there are at least two dozen times. So if the one about Hanoch the shoemaker is one column that holds up everything he knows, this text is the other one. Can I ask someone to read, I heard an explanation of the following. It's from Toldot Yaakov Yosef, Tetzave, Session 5, Community, First Source, smack dab in the middle. Please, Ryan. Thank you. I heard an explanation explanation of the following Talmudic passage in the name of my teacher, the Besht. These two merrymakers are worthy of the world to come. Hold there. He asked about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Brian. So what's up with this passage in the Talmud? Has anyone ever seen this before? Yeah, it's like it's a part of a Talmudic tractate that that most people don't end up studying unless you really want to. Um, it's not one of the classic ones that are learned in yeshivot, um, even in the 19th century, sorry, in the 18th century, before the great emergence of um, like 19th century Lithuanian styles of learning. In the 18th century, there's a kind of um, informal curriculum is what's studied in Ta'anit is not there. The third chapter of Ta'anit, where this comes from, is a really, it's I, probably one of the top three weirdest chapters of the Talmud, at least in terms of oddness. And um, um, the the stories in the fifth chapter of Bhava Batra, which are all the weird fish stories, um, and like literally almost like fantastic stories about uh, about giant sea monsters, perhaps comes close. But I still think that Tani takes the cake um, in many respects. It's I, I once counted, I think there are like 22 or 23 strange characters that you meet in this chapter of the Talmud, who we don't know that much about, but they're these kind of like fringe figures, especially from the Galilee, who tend to be miracle workers and can do strange things like bring rain. And you're almost reading this and you're like, wow, they can re bring rain, they can do this. They speak a strange Galilean dialect, and you're almost expecting them to walk on water and turn you know, like uh, blood into wine and things like that. And you get a sense of the interesting world of Galilean spirituality. The um, one of the stories here is about two rabbis who are walking in a um, in, in in the market. And one of them asks the other, um, who here is world worthy of the world to come? And they receive the answer. Hane tre badche these two merrymakers. Um, you could also translate it as clowns. You could, you could also translate it as um, jesters. And I think you could also translate it as fools. 
um, fools in like the Shakespearean sense of telling truth to power and people who exist on the margin and are able to use humor to to accomplish what prose or with what um, um, declarative statements do not. And that's kind of where the story ends. There's a little bit more. There's not that much more. And I once tried to do a report when I was in graduate school um, in in Israel, when I was studying at the Hartman Institute, um, I tried to give a shiur on like the interpretive traditions of this between the Talmud and the Baal Shem Tov. And there's almost nothing on it. Every once in a while, someone will cite it, but almost no one picked this up. It's here from time to time. Um, but the fact that it's cited with relative infrequency for, uh, what's that, 1300 years? and then is cited two dozen times in the writings of the of the Toldos of Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Illinois, tells you something that there's something new happening here. So now we're going to get the best explanation as to why this might be. Okay, Brian, continue. Thank you. He asked about it in a dream, <clears throat> learning that these two merrymakers were totally devoted to connecting with each and every person unifying the Blessed Holy One and the Shekinah in all deeds, at home and in business, in general and in every moment. Okay. Yet they were unable to connect with... Oh, yep. Hold there. Good. Thank you. Sorry to cut, cut in on you. So the Baal Shem Tov, what is this bit about the She'ela, the asking? It's an old Jewish practice. I mean, literally, it's sleeping on it. You have a question, textual, existential, philosophical, Kabbalistic. And so we have, like, we actually have dream journals from different people at different times. And sometimes people are just stumped by a question, and they ask it at night, and then they either get the answer or they get a vision that gives them the answer. It's really an interesting one. Sometimes we even have, like, legal writings that come out of this. They're really, really fascinating. Um, and... There's a great passage actually in the Talmud, it's even in earlier literature also, about whether or not dreams can be used in halachic decision-making. And there's a great dream in which someone, um, <laughs> there's a great story in which someone has a dream in which he finds a bunch of treasure in his backyard that belongs to someone else. And so he goes out and he digs it up and he, he finds that the, there actually is treasure, but the um, decision of the Talmud is that he doesn't have to give the treasure to someone else because dreams can't be counted in halacha. So he finds the treasure, but it, it doesn't belong to someone else. It's an amazing sort of like trying to figure out how do you use this knowledge and also like what are the implications of it? Once you go to the realm of allowing dreams, uh, it's not just the Talmud, Freud, Kafka, they've taught us that dreams are a place in which interesting things happen. But for the best, dreams are great. Dreams are not something to be feared. Dreams are the place where the mind's eye opens in new ways. So he asks this question, like I'm stumped by this passage in the Talmud, tell me an answer. And lo and behold, he gets it. And what's the answer? Here's a great example of a text that no one, okay, not no one, but no, almost no one picked up on that's, as you would say, hidden in plain sight. And the reading that the Bel Shem Tov either receives or comes up with is totally compatible with, I think, the plain sense meaning of the verse or the plain sense meaning of what's happening in that story. And yet, just because it's compatible doesn't mean it's identical. There's something new here that's happening. So what's the claim to fame of Hane Tre Badche? Yeah, Brian. Um, is he saying that these two merrymakers, um, perhaps unlikely figures, 
are in fact worthy of, of reward because of their sociality, their conviviality, um, mm -hmm. that this is actually something, you know, this is very serious stuff. <laughs> it's not, it's not um, to be dismissed. Good. Their sociality, as you put it, their conviviality, their connectiveness in parenting we talk about, no one ever talks about, we're not allowed to talk about attention-seeking behavior. You have to talk about connection-seeking behavior in all of its forms. So now their connective work, their connective-seeking behavior is something that is not trivial. In fact, it is foundational. It is one that bestows the greatest virtue. Fantastic. Stephen, and then Tom. Yeah, just, just continuing on that, I mean, basically he's saying that what they're doing is un a unification. It's as, yeah. it's as important as the complex things that they're doing in Svat. Good. So it's the same language. So what the people were doing in Svat, contemplating the four different worlds and the ten spherot, which in each of those worlds, and the ten spherot that exist within each of the ten spherot, and the different names of the divine that exist within each of the ten spherot, that exist within each of the ten spherot, that exist within the ten, four worlds, and like that's the easy stuff. What that what's being accomplished there, which is it, it, it ponderously important, right? Like what Sholem says that the great innovation of Tzfat is to turn the religious and ritual life of every Jew into the cosmic story of the unfolding of God and exile and, and tikkun and redemption, you know, uh, maybe Sholem overplayed his hand, but maybe he didn't, but certainly in Hasidism that comes to the fore. And it's not just in keeping halakha, it's not just in prayer or worship or study, it's in the connection of this unification of the what Brian called the sociality of these figures. Good, Tom. Yeah, well, I think the word devoted is also important in a slightly different dimension. I, I mean, it's not just saying that merrymaking may, you know, this may appear to the outside to be just merrymaking, but there is a there is some uh, deep kavana here that's happening. Yeah. It's 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 known to them what they're doing and intending, and it is intentional. It's not it just is. happening amazingly while they're merrymaking. All this other profound stuff is happening. They yeah. intend it to happen. Good. So, They're devoted to it. Great. Maybe we could say they intended it to happen, and it's their intention that allows it to happen. If I'm understanding you correctly, this is something that is, um, that is, um, it's not by happenstance, and it's not by accident, but it is the defining feature of their lives. I struggle to translate kol iskam, like their entire, uh, I mean, it means business, but it means esek also in the sense of like their project, what they're doing. And devotion is one of these great words that we have in English from Latin that we don't have in Hebrew. There's not really any clear way to translate it. Um, hit masrut or masirat nefesh is one part of that. It's devotion giving over to. Um, dveikut, connection, is another part of that. And esik in the sense of like they are immersed and working on this project all, all the time is another one. Good, Tom. Elio. Hello. Hi. Please. I would, every time he said that she Shekhinah needs us to come back to God. Shekhina needs us to do something to, to come back to God. Né? Yeah. As clearly Shekhina is separated from, from God. Yeah. But I am a member of the Nahum tale of the Lost Princess. Yeah. It is not the same. Né? Shekhina comes, but not with us. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of different way of seeking the link between Shekhina and God. And Really, I would like to know why the, all the time Shekhinah is lost for somebody God, understand? Why mm -hmm. the Shekhinah needs us to come back to God? Fantastic. Amazing. One of the great innovations of 13th century Kabbalah, you see it already in the writings of Nachmanides, of Ramban, is that God is in need of human action. So the way that Ram, Ramban says it is that the mitzvot lo letzorach hediot nitnu. 
the mitzvot were given not only for um, um, a mundane or ordinary purpose, and so the opposite in rabbinic literature, tzorach hediot, is um, tzorach gavoa, um, a supernal or divine need. And what that means in the original context um, need not concern us, but it's things in the temple that um, are um, are of either divine providence or the divine sphere, as opposed to those which are really just part of the ritual grammar for what human beings need, um, or to whom it, 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 it belongs in a certain sense. But the way that Nachmanides and then his commentators who invert that say, the mitzvot are given the tzorach gavoa, it means God is in need of human action, of human partnership. And we don't know exactly why in the writings of Nachmanides, he doesn't quite tell us, but in the writings of the Rashba, in the writings of um, Rabbeinu Bachia, um, and the others who are either followers of the Ramban's school or literary and theological inheritors thereof, they describe human action and specifically the mitzvot as bringing together the sfirot as ushering in the divine flow of blessing into this world, of healing some element of a divine that is in current fracture. Um, there are different ways that it's described there. What happens in, um, and like a good example of this is in the 15th century is Meiri bin Gabay in Avodat HaKodesh. It's um, that you could say that the mitzvot letzorach kavoa, um, let's use Heschel's phrase, of God in search of human deeds, of God in search of human action, is the great theme of religious life. There's a reason that Heschel actually loved that book, um, Avodat HaKodesh by Meir Ibn Gabay. In Sfat, there's a, another turn that happens on this great wheel of theology in which when God creates the world, by withdrawing or focusing and then creating the sfirot, the original version of them breaks, it shatters and it falls apart and leaves us with a fractured world in which we are on the one hand um, charged with returning those back to God and on the other hand we are um, asked to remember that we live in a world that is constantly broken and the great transformation that happens in Hasidism is that that is extended not just to Kabbalists, but to all people, and not just to the work of the commandments, but to all actions. And I think we see that here. And so, coming back to your question, God and Shechina, the Kujabrihu and Shechina, or these two manifestations of God are far away. Like Rabbi Nachman's tale of the lost princess. And what happens in The Lost Princess is like the princess gets back, but we don't know how. But if you look at the later stories from Rabbi Nachman and you look at, let's say, The Seven Beggars, and you get that great story of Halev Vehamayan, the heart of the world and the fountain of the world and the fountain that lives on top of the mountain, and they want to get to each other, but they can't ever get to each other. And if they get too close, then they fall out of sight from one another. And once they're out of sight, then everything is destroyed. So the only way that the world can endure, according to Rabbi Nachman in that, in that story, is by virtue of the quest, by virtue of something that can't fully be, be, be connected. Um, and there it's almost like the, the, the ethos of Song of Songs, which ends not with the connection and the con consummation of that love, but with brach the chadodi, like, go, go forth, my beloved. And it, it ends not with a hello, but with a goodbye. Um, and in Hasidic sources, this notion of the Holy One and the Blessed, sorry, the Blessed Holy One and Shechina being far apart means living with the fracture of our world and knowing that we can create, even if temporary, what scholars of ritual call a subjunctive world, like a subjunctive clause after a, um, after a comma, in which things make sense, in which order has been brought to the chaos, and in which healing has been brought to the fracture, even though you know it's not the end of the story. 
Um, one more thing to say on that, and then Beth, I want to I want to hear your comment or question, um, which is that Blessed Holy One and Shechina have very um, I would say well developed Kabbalistic associations with the world to come, the Blessed Holy One, and Shechina, the world as it is. This world. And so one of the great lessons of Kabbalah is keeping one eye trained on the world as it is, what Kabbalah calls the whatness of the world, what, W-H-A-T, ma. Um, you might say in the words of the phenomenologists, it's the givenness of the world, while on the other hand, or with the other eye, keeping one's vision always trained on the possibility of what could be. That's the world to come. But the great hop, or the great, I would say, um, um, the great intervention there that goes all the way back to Maimonides and into the Zohar is that the world that is coming isn't just something that is held in abeyance for the future, but it's something that's possible in this world. Olam haba, the world that is coming, the world to come, is also olam haba tamid, alma da'ate tadir. It's the world that's always there. So in the Zohar, that's about the Sfirot. For Maimonides, that's about philosophical contemplation. And what is it in Hasidism? Joy, sociality, connection, even sometimes silly things, as we will see. Okay, Beth, please. Pursuant to Ilya's question, about why does Shekhinah need us to connect to God? Um, there is something about us as being part of creation, not the only part of creation, but certainly a conscious part of creation that is somehow necessary. You know, here we are, here is this universe that we inhabit. Here are, uh, you know, the planets, the stars, the galaxies. Here's the trees, the soil under our feet, all the microbes in the soil, the insects, the birds, the butterflies, the animals. And we know in Tehillim, it says that all the world is singing to God. Mm -hmm. And we are too, and it's it. It strikes me almost as this is um, an existential necessity. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the fact that we're alive and part of the world we inhabit. That if we're paying attention, we can't help but participate in this song, and that it has this connective manifestation that is the natural segue or association with it so that's my sense of this how we are an intermediary it, it's it's like we can't help it Diberti. and maybe the only way we could help it or the only way that we get distracted from this is thinking about ordinary things as if they were ordinary. So there's on one level, we're all a part of this project, but it also requires the opening of the inner eye. I think that's one of the great lessons of Hasidism is that um, things can be organic without being automatic in the sense of it doesn't always happen and there are other potentials. And yet you're right. I mean, one of the, the things that's so striking about these Hasidic sources is that it's not about drawing divinity into the world. It's about opening your eyes to the fact that divinity is there and opening your ears to the radiance of that song that you were just reminding us of. And yet there's also some some work of human action in engaging with that. I think that your, uh, your point about the um, existential dimension of this is really well taken. Good, thank you so much. Gurval, please. Just to reform that a little bit, I, uh, I, I go back to the uh, Kohenet re-reading of two weeks ago. Yeah. And um, I think the word action is is amazing. It's an ama it's amazing. You know, it, it, the, the, the text 
Umel talks about um, Chochma as being Ein Sof and without limit. And um, and when you when you focus your attention to what you're doing, uh, you're, you're binding thought and action together. You're stitching thought and action together. Something magical happens. Yeah. And it, uh, I think that it, it, to me, it was, in a, one reading would be, well, if you don't put your thoughts into what you're doing, mm -hmm. you are, you're a zombie, you're, 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 you're zombie-like. Um, and this is, you know, he talks about, I, you know, the ion is operating above and below. And so the world below becomes zombie land and you're a zombie. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it also means that if thought is left and so wandering in the above, uh, does not concentrate into action, does not bind itself to action below. Mm -hmm. That thought is also sucked into iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, to your point about God in need of human action, it's almost, I know, become, you know I, I, <laughs> heretical, but it's the idea, you know, that God needs our action. It needs us to bind Ainsof to, to, to Kuachma, to action in order to for God to be present in this world, that God is kind of floating above unless we act and 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 we stitch thought to action. And so that's a comment. Um uh and the, the question I had was, does that does that mean that 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 every action becomes a prayer? Does that does that mean that uh, there's nothing special about praying, you know, actual um, uh, and that cobbling and shoemaking, stitching, as long as you are binding thought and action together, as long as you're present in whatever it is that you're doing, that is prayer. And um, and there's nothing special about prayer anymore. Um, great. Every action is a prayer, for sure. Full stop. You might also say that every prayer is an action. And just because something is not exclusive doesn't mean it's not special. So here I think what, what we might say about, um, let's say, prayer, Torah study, the classical mitzvot, there are two ways to frame what their special claim to fame is. One is in the Hasidic canon. One is if you had a kind of continuum of intensity, they are on the far extreme. It's not that they're totally dissimilar to ordinary life, but it is they are a heightened, transformative potential of if, you know, ordinary life, we have that um, possibility on a level three or on a level four, there it's level 11. It's all the way. The other way is, and this is something that people like Buber read into Hasidism, and I think they're really not wrong, which is that you're given a script, but it's not exclusive, and it teaches you a way of seeing and a way of thinking, and it opens the eyes to the possibilities of the world around you. But you have to start from somewhere. And that's what the work of ritual is, is that it is able to open and transform those possibilities such that you start with the prayer book, but you realize that it doesn't end there. We had a really great moment of this with one, my, my, uh, my youngest son is in first grade now. And a few weeks ago, we had his Sidor party at his school and he got his first prayer book. It's really sweet. And the parents are charged with making a little cover for it. And he wanted the Garden of Eden and the Nachash and like Adam and Chave. It was like this whole thing that he wanted. And I am a like supremely, Tom can tell you, I love art and I'm supremely artistically challenged. Um, one of my kids once asked me to draw a, um, um, what did he ask? A lizard? It was a lizard driving a car. 
and it's like, I'm happy to write a book, but that scared me. I was unable to do it. I it took me like an hour to just sit down and do it. So Daniel, my son asked me to make, help him make this C-Door cover and he gave it to me and he like, he told me what he wanted. And my other son, Ezra, one of my other sons, like showed me, he drew a picture of it and was like, dad, this is what you have to do. And I spent five hours painting this thing. I was so proud of myself and I used the wrong paint. I used whatever the like acrylic watercolor is that never dries as opposed to the acrylic stuff that actually dries, whatever it was. And so you pick up this prayer book and your hands come away stained. And on the one hand, I was like, wow, I spent five hours and I like ruined this thing. And then I was like, well, on the other hand, there's a beautiful way of thinking about prayer here. You pick up the book and it leaves you transformed. And it's the sticky, I love it. It's the stickiness of that experience that you then take with you into the marketplace. And it might be a matter of fluctuating in between heightened and lower forms of worship. That's what one of the sources that we looked at um, about um, a chayot ratzo v'shov, then in the moments of closeness and expansiveness, that's when you can do it through like worship and through tefillah and through davening and through study. But there are other moments where we're a little bit farther away and we're a little bit, we're on the sort of like uh, um, lower ebb of our orbit or whatever, however we would say that to mix a few metaphors together. And that's where eating and drinking and other things come to the fore. Um, I, I, I'm often drawn to the fact that or I'm often drawn to the reading, which complements that, if it doesn't contradict it, by in seeing these moments of um, intense connectivity as being ones that show us the potential of everything. And so, like, let's look at the source that we're thinking about here. How do you know how to connect to other people if you don't know how to connect to God? And how do you know how to connect to God if you don't know how to connect to other people? I think that's one of the great lessons that you see in this source, and it actually goes there. And one of the ways that we do that is through prayer. And one of the ways that we do that is through prayer in community in particular. And the last source or one of the last sources here is really about that and about the fact that 10 different people who come together for prayer to compose the minion are all doing totally different things. They're on their own journeys and they have their own wishes. And yet they somehow bring themselves together toward a single aim. And that's the power of what um, um, educational sociologists sometimes call a community of practice about what happens when you bring the people together. Um, great question. Ilio, I want to um, hear yours in just one, one second. I want to respond to Brian's question in the chat. So yeah, um, I actually helped publish Malila's book in English. Um, it's in my book series at Stanford, which is, you know, one of our one of our great claims to fame is uh, publishing Malila's books. Um, the other book that I would um, recommend, and it's one that I, I, I actually got the phrase subjunctive world from, is um, um, Seligman, uh, Adam Seligman, and there's uh, three other co-authors, wrote a book called On the Limits of Sincerity. Um, uh, what's it called? Ritual and Its Consequences on the Limits of Sincerity, which is um, a really, really great book. It's a short book, and the arguments of that book um, have many implications for Jewish studies, even though they're not founded in Jewish studies. But one of the things that they argue there is ritual is not a sometimes food, it's an everyday food. We just don't think about it in those terms. We're all doing ritual all the time. And another thing that they describe is, they, you know, for, for, for the practitioners of ritual, and we think through ritual, like that, what we were talking about with Shilbrak, um, for practitioners of ritual, you step into a temporary world through the creation of meaning, even while knowing in some part of our brain that it is only temporary. That's the creation of a subjunctive world. Okay, Ilio. Please. Sorry, a, a quick commentary. Beside that, yeah. in another area, we have a very famous phrase from Jacques Lacan, the French philo uh, psychoanalyst, this really very famous phrase that is, we don't have sexual relationship. Many people, well, why this phrase? Mm -hmm. We have sexual, he said, for sure, you have the physical relationship, but really masculine is one side, the feminine is the other side. Mm -hmm. It's not connected, it's really not connected. You have physical relationship to try to connect them, but here is 
one side, you order the other side. It's illogical. They don't have connections. Mm -hmm. Only to to put beside. They think it's interesting to think. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's this sense in Hasidism and in Kabbalah that both the Blessed and Holy One exists within all people and within all times, and it's a matter of bringing those things together. I think in many respects, Hasidism is so much more um, optimistic about so many things than Lacan and others. Um, and while there's this amazing, I would say, um, awareness in Hasidism and in the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov too about the ever-present nature of the abyss, which is something they talk about, there's also a sense that like one can, one can overcome it. I think that's one of the differences in between the Baal Shem Tov and Rabbi Nachman. Um, Rabbi Nachman lives in a world in which that abyss is defining, or that void is defining, definitional to human existence. And for the Baal Shem Tov, um, I think there is a kind of confidence and, um, ooh, I love that, um, about the anima and animus, um, there is a confidence in the writings of the Baal Shem Tov that these things can happen. The, the princess can be returned. We can have connections with other people and with ourselves, of which Eros is what, but one articulation of that power of human connectivity. Eros in, or say, let's say Eros in its broadest um, um, uh, Hellenistic sense of which human sexuality is but one articulation is something that allows for connectivity on the most fundamental level and that is in fact possible and in fact the people who do this work the um, the jesters the fools the um, the merrymakers the clowns who who, who who are at the center of this source um, that is the defining feature of their lives and when are they doing it all the time at home and in business in the line at the supermarket on the bus and in the synagogue in general and in every moment bichlal ubiprat bichlal ubiprat okay so let's continue um maybe brian you'd be willing to read the last bit of the source for us yet they okay. Yet they were unable to connect with someone who was melancholy. So they would cheer this person up with words until that individual became joyous, becoming attached to that person. Through this, they connected with them to God. This is an important principle. Understand it. Okay. So what do we make of this? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, I just think there's a beautiful connection here with with what Gurval was talking about the intention. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, that their response is something very intentional um, until that individual became joyous. That that to me suggests you know the attempts that have to be made. Um, but there's something very committed good very committed yeah tom um i don't know my initial reaction is it's very self-serving i mean the, the the culmination of this is that they did this cheering up to to connect themselves to god and that their year their real yearning is for their connection not really with this it doesn't say that, and they succeeded in connecting this person to god Mm -hmm. and brought them up to where they are or something like that um it's so I, that that's just an impression maybe i'm missing something here i i mean i i uh, i understand kind of the intention as is holding something good but i'm a little puzzled by through this they they connected with them well i guess they brought the, all of them together into a group yeah yeah i, so I guess you... i can read it differently yeah yeah that's what it sounds like to me is that the the group, the melancholy people and the gestures, yeah. gestures, 
all connected with God. I the Hebrew is in too tiny of a font for me to be able to read it huh? without my big magnifying glass, but at least the English is that's how I interpret it. Stephen, did you want to come in on this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I got from this is that they were aware and open enough to see the need in this particular place. That they they didn't just say, here's how we do it. It's like, oh, this person needs me to do this. And then they were able to do that to in order to raise everyone up. Yeah. You know, I, Tom, your point is well taken. And I think there are multiple possible sort of like self-centered dimensions of this source. And we'll come to one of them in just another one in just a second. Um, the Hebrew, I think, sustains the more charitable reading that we have been giving this source. And I think that's probably the best one, given given the ethos of the of the teaching itself. Um, but just to hear it, 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 it makes no sense. <laughs> and the ambiguity that you're feeling is actually there in the original. So they, um, these people bring joy through their, um, through their words, through their speech, until that person becomes joyous. Venit chaber imo, they, they connect to that person. Lidabek um, oto, or ito, both are possible. Imo bo yitbarach, and they connect that person with him to the divine, they connect with that person to the blessed Holy One. It's not exactly clear, but I, and it's very characteristic of Hasidic Hebrew. Um, I, I think the best possible translation of this would be that in becoming connected to that other person, they then open up this channel of possibility where they, the two Bad Khanim, and the person who was before then isolated in their sadness becomes then total, all three of them, all four of them, however many we want to count, connected to the divine. And so it is that kind of social dimension that is not just this person who's sad becomes a tool for my own self-gratification, but rather if I wish to stand in God's presence, I do so by virtue of the connective work that I have done with other people. And that's something that you find throughout the sources. Um, it's something that you find in, and we'll see it in just a second, in a super clear way as being a foundational principle of Hasidut. If you wish to stand in God's presence, you do so by virtue of the connection to other people. Now, is it not true that we have the right to be sad? Hasidut has, on the one hand, a potential reading, which is all very saccharine and, you know, always be happy all the time, even when things are not so good. Mitzvah gadol eliyot b'simcha. But I think the way that we translate that word is actually really important, which is that it's um, it's a great commandment or a great imperative to be joyous. And here I would think with philosophers and writers who have done a lot of work on joy in trying to think about the difference between joy and happiness. And if happiness is a kind of fleeting thing that is cast upon us, joy is a studied attempt to make sense of the world. And it is a, um, I think Ross Gay has done, done tremendous work on this. Um, anyone know the music of John Batiste? So like, if you wanna understand the source, I think you gotta listen to the album, We Are. I really think that this is a, 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 foundational, um, a, a foundational teaching for, for, for that. And um, part of the message of that is that joy, which happens in community, which happens through interpretation, which happens through music, which happens through, um, um, through sociality for Batiste, is not defined by circumstance. It's defined by intention. And the word sa'ar here is one that connotes suffering, it connotes melancholy, it connotes isolation. I think that's one of the ways that it's often used in the Talmud. And what do the people do? I mean, there is a very sort of, I would say, um, offensive reading of the source, which is like, you know, you go into a shiva house and you tell a joke. And I think it's not that. It's not that. But it's having 
the strength of character to sit on the bench next to someone who is alone and to find the right way to allow connection to come back. And sometimes that means metabolizes their, metabolizing their hurt and being able to just, like, accept it. It's like um, I say sometimes, I don't know if we've talked about it here, but I'm obsessed with bears. I live and dream and think about bears all the time. And so sometimes I, I pretend that I have um, earplugs that translate my kids into bear talk. And when my kids are yelling and screaming and saying, I'm mad, I hate you, why is this, why is that? I hear what black bears do when black bears huff. Has anyone seen a black bear in the wild? They huff and they charge and they make these big displays and they're telling you something very clear. I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And so sometimes this source is about just sitting and being able to like allow that to come in. And we get this from the people who in all sorts of ways in our lives, we open ourselves to. And sometimes it's just being able to sit there and stay with the trouble. And sometimes it's being able to have that courage to reach out when that person needs it, whether that's through a text message or through a phone call or just sitting next to them and reminding them that connectivity is possible. And to do so with a sense of, of joy is perhaps the greatest work that we can do in this world. So it's not only that, it's that that's the way that we become agents of divinity, agents of connection, agents of intention in this world. And so if we talked about the source with Hanoch and the shoemaker as being one, which is not only internal, but per perhaps primarily internal, where we undertake what some might call the kind of hero's journey of Judaism, of taking one's circumstances and making them into something, a life of meaning. Here it is that, but it's on the social plane. Now I want to move on, and I know our time is growing, um, growing short. Um, I want to move on to a source that's just below that. Um, which is a, I mean, you, you could read a dozen books on the Baal Shem Tov and not come to the source. It's a little bit off the, off the beaten path, but it's, um, it's one that I think is just, first of all, I think it's probably a correct one. I think that, you know, I would, I would put this in writing that this is an authentic tradition because it feels authentic. And I've spent a whole lot of time thinking with the Baal Shem Tov, and this is the one that has his fingerprints all over it. And this is something from, um, a, a, a figure, who ended up in Tiveria. He was a part of the um, Hasidic community that moved to the Holy Land in the 1770s. And they do so perhaps in order to found their small Hasidic communities that are um, really maybe hotbeds of spiritual creativity is a good way to put it. I would say communities of practice. Um, and we know that because all the texts that they have talk about Dibuk Chaverim, the connection between people, between friends. Dvekut, connection with God, Dibu Chaverim, Dvekut with other human beings. And this is one of the sources that they say. Um, it's in the name of the Besht, who used to say the following before the blowing of the shofar. Put a pin in that. So what does he say? Ir un ich un got. Un got un ir un ich. Un ich un ir un got. You and I and God. God and you and me. Me and you and God. Bekachaya Omer, that's like what we say about the high priest on Yom, Yom Kippur. This is what he would say, Kama Pe'amim, many times. And then they would do Tkiyata Shofar. So the Shofar is blown. Not after a long sermon, not after an appeal. I mean, maybe this is an appeal. It's an appeal to the heart. And it's a declaration of how many words? 12, 15, something like that. Repeated, we don't know how many times, but presumably many. And I think the fundamental social message of Hasidism is here. You and I and God. 
And in some ways, there's a collapsing of those identities. Because the Tzadav Shave, the unifying factor in between two different people, is the fact that both are stamped in the image of the divine. And that the same divinity that flows through one person flows through the other in a kind of ecology or divine economy of life. And the shofar, that blasting sound, which we know already from the time of Joshua, can bring the walls down. <laughs> and here it's the walls of consciousness, and it's also the walls in between us and other people. And go back to what we looked at on the first, I think it was the first session, um, the image of the king who set up the palace filled with, was it the first session or the second session? I don't remember where we where we talked about it. Um, the king who sets up the palace and the child of the king or the child of the ruler who makes his way all the way there and connects and then all sees that it was all an illusion all along. And that was that was before the shofar was blown. So that was an elaborate parable. And I don't know if this like goes against that in fact, I think they go together in a certain sense that when the walls come crashing down, when the illusions of multiplicity collapse, it's not just me and God. That's not the story of Hasidism. And in many respects, I think that's not the story of Jewish mysticism. It's not me and God. It's me and God and you, and you, and me, and God, and me, and you, and God. And we experience that moment of divine electrification, of kind of illumination. And in doing so, it doesn't cast a shadow on our ordinary life. That illumination transforms our ordinary life and illuminates our relationships with other people and reminds us of that great teaching that Heschel often quoted. We're not allowed to make images of God, not because God has no image, but because the only fitting image of God is the sum totality of life and of the sum totality of the life that stands in front of you. Be that human, be that more than human, not sure. And I'm reminded also of Martin Buber's great teaching that relation is reciprocity, and reciprocity is relation. And as we encounter the other, we open ourselves to them, and we work on them, but we also allow them to work on us. And the result of that connective work is God. So I think we're going to pause here. Um, there's many more sources to look at. Um, you have the story of the death of the Baal Shem Tov. You have the letter that he wrote to Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya. And you have a bunch of others on um, sociology and conviviality in Hasidism. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for your heartfelt presence. And I am totally available by email, by phone, by Zoom, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I really hope that we can have the opportunity to learn together again. And my thanks to Drisha for making this possible, to Evie for your wonderful facilitation. Um, and thank you all. Pinchas of Koritz is on the Google Doc. Thank you so much, Rabbi Mays, for sharing your Torah with us, not only today, but the whole session. It was wonderful. And um, I hope you teach another session sometime. And uh, thank you so much to everyone who uh, participate, not only on Zoom, but uh, also those who watched us uh, live on Facebook. Uh, we do need to um, close the room so questions can be follow up d directly with uh, Rabbi Mays. Um, and uh, I hope to see you in our next class today, which is um, the Parasha Shi'ur. Uh, so let's for now. Thank you very much to everybody.